that's what she said. The ultimate joke, dating back to, I don't know, like the Victorian era when uh, said the said the lady to the bishop or something like that, and obviously then made famous again by The Office. That's why I am so excited to have Joe Musso here today with us. We are talking about tips for communication that builds connection. So how do you say the right thing to actually build that connection, build that relationship in that moment and make sure you were truly heard and understood in both directions? For those who don't know Joe, he's a performance growth and leadership trainer for plaintiff law firms. His company, his company's mission is to make better lawyers, better leaders and better lives. I love that. He's also the owner of the Musa Law Firm, which is devoted exclusively to the prosecution of nursing home abuse claims on behalf of residents and their families. He's a certified leadership trainer with John Maxwell Leadership. He's the past chair of the Virginia Long-Term Care Litigation Section, as well as the current chair of the AAJ Nursing Home Litigations Group Mentorship Committee. Joe, nice to have you. A pleasure. It's kind of surreal being on your podcast as much as I've watched it and seen these videos and followed you on all your social media. I'm a big fan. So it's kind of like wild to be actually talking to you on your program. So thank you so much for having me. Hey, I am so honored. You know, it's funny. I used to think I I used to be so honored to be a guest and I <laughs> right. used to be so honored to have guests. And then I realized all of us want to be here at like the exact <laughs> right. same level. You know, you want to be a guest. I want to have a guest, vice versa. So I, uh, so it's a win-win and then, uh, for anybody listening, they should win too. So we should have a win-win-win going on here. You embody a lot of, a lot of what kind of inspired the, the recent changes in my career. You know, this idea of living better, lo- a better life as an attorney and not just kind of going with the generational, you know, you got to kill yourself, decide whether you want to be sick, addicted, and tired, and be a lawyer, or get out of law so you can be happy, fulfilled, and healthy, <laughs> right? I love that. I love the whole theme of what you are and what you bring, and so just so honored, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, that means a lot, and the more the more that we have more people talking about this, the more we yeah. convince people that there is a way to thread that needle and have a firm you can be proud of and a life that's even better. Because it's so, like like you were saying in the last episode that I was uh, listening to, I listen to it a lot of times while I walk my dog, um, that I'm praying right now is not going to start barking and flipping out during the middle of the podcast as we discussed off, off the air. Um, the statistics are just so grim for our profession. And when one of us, like you, goes out there and says, hey, have we decided we might want to push back on some of this, <laughs> right? Hey, maybe maybe it doesn't have to be this way. You kind of have, you know, you grant permission to set other people free, which I think is great, which is really a large part of what inspired my coaching practice. I mean, I've been a, a coach for a long time. I've been a coach since I graduated from my first coaching school, I guess, at 2010. But, you know, I'm a litigator. I've got a 60-hour week day job. So I was you know, spending some time each week on a very small practice. But the more I kind of encountered people sick, addicted, tired, you know, jokes that stop being funny. I, I recently gave a, a speech to the Boardwalk Seminar in New Jersey about how when I first showed up at a wellness ethics credit and heard the stats, as a first-year lawyer, they just kind of zoom right by you. Uh, halfway through my career around the 10th year, you see them and you go, wow, that's really difficult. And now you know a couple people who it's actually real. You've actually got a name to go with it. By the time you get to 25 years in and you're back now giving that speech instead of just sitting in the audience and you realize the statistics are either worse or the same, that none of them are better. And now you know a lot of people and you realize, heck, some of this is me now. Like, you know, we got to be part of the solution, which is, I think, what you're doing, what I'm trying to do, what what people who do this work are trying to do, coaches and and people who are trying to train people on, hey, it doesn't have to be the way you grew up in it. Yes. Well, and it's, I mean, look, the uh, those in power want to maintain the status quo. You know, that goes back to, I'm sure, cavemen and and Neanderthals back in the day. Um, So, the benefit though is i think we have more accessibility than ever before which hopefully allows uh, fewer people to break the chains easier 
Don't you think it's, don't you think so? I mean, so, so I think, yes, I think there's certainly a group of people who probably just want to hold on to power, hold on to the, the way that they want for their own selfish kind of means. Um, I think there's a lot of people who just don't know any better. I, I think our profession has a generational hand it down over and over and over. Hey, you know, you got got to work 70 hours a week. That's just the way this profession is. And it gets handed down. Some people are like, well, well, I did it. So you're going to do it. Um, and, and others just don't realize there's another way. And, and I know that, that this, this talk we're supposed to have today is about, about communication, but it, it flows into this whole idea because what the foundation of our, our communication really is, is are you focused on yourself and what you can gain? Or are you focused on your people and what they can gain? You, you talked at the beginning of this about the idea of how do we say what we really mean and get the receivers to hear it. And that actually really begins with, do you care about the receiver or are you trying to get the receiver to do something for you? The difference between manipulation and leadership, essentially. That makes sense? Yeah, give me that one more time. That was gold right there. It's, it's the difference between leadership and manipulation or, or even I think management is, is a little difficult too, where what you're trying to do is get yourself in a frame of mind where you're thinking about the receiver, right? I, I speak a lot. I speak at, at my church and men's ministry. I speak um, obviously in seminars and I obviously speak as a coach and My speaking really changed when I made a shift in my mind. And it was the shift, and the same thing happened in my mentorship and and all that. When you make the shift from what am I trying to get from them to what am I trying to give them? It's it's such a huge difference. When When you get up to speak to a room of people for years, I mean, I'm talking about like till a couple of years ago. Um, and I learned this through, through Maxwell, is this idea that I would stand up there and I would say, you know, how bald do I look? How fat do I look? Am I going to remember the opening? What am I going to miss? Are they laughing at that joke that I put there? Does this make sense? And what I'm really saying is, are they going to like me? Are they going to applaud for me? Am I going to get all the feelings that I expect to get my ego stroked by in this speech that is really all about me and my performance. What I really want is a whole lot of pats on the back when this is over saying, oh, you were brilliant, whether, you know, which people say to you, whether you're good or not, right? It, it's, See, it's, it's so funny to me because I try so hard to get constructive feedback. Yeah, right. after so you're brilliant. That's the yeah. constructive feedback. You I'm always- like, no, I wasn't. But like, come on, give me give me something here. No, and it's but it's I don't know. I don't know what that says about me. If that, if either I'm a humble or I'm a masochist or or both. Well, no, I think the more you, the more you learn this and the more you realize that we're all, we're all vulnerable and we're all trying to protect ourselves to some extent. Right. And so I wanted feedback for years as a speaker, but all I really wanted was to hear the, you're brilliant. Right. When I really wanted real feedback, like I really want someone to say, hey, you were too fast or I didn't understand that part or because a lot of times you end up telling the same story over and over at a lot of different things. You really want to get better at it. Right. But everyone just keeps saying, oh, you were great. You were brilliant. We loved it. Thank you. Please come back again. And, and you go, no, no, I really I really want I really would love to get some really good feedback here. And they just can't give it to you because they would have they can't be vulnerable enough to criticize you. And which, you which know, goes to the Brene Brown, right? Like none of us want to exactly share vulnerability, right. but we want to see everybody else. But we connect best with people when they share their vulnerability. That's it. That's it. But that's the same thing with communication. I mean, there's three things. And this is whether you're talking to your clients. This is whether you're talking to your referral sources. This is whether you're talking to your bank, <laughs> you know, whether you're talking to your staff, or this is whether you're talking to, to your, you know, your wife or your kids. They want to know three things. Do you care about me? Can you actually help me? And do I trust you? And if your communication says, I care about you, because nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. If if you've demonstrated that you truly care about your client, you truly care about your people, and they believe that because it's real, 
Okay. Now, this gets so difficult because the moment you try, because there will be people who hear this, hit this podcast and they'll go back to their, their desks on Monday and they'll go, all right, I got I to gotta get my, my people to think I care about them. And they'll start thinking about like ways that they could make them think they care about them. And what I would coach them is on, hey, do you actually care about them? Because if you don't, that's the actual problem, not your communication. <laughs> I love um, Bob, Bob Berg or, or Bob Berg and one of his writers and go giver has, I think the best line you have to put, I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. I'm sorry, Bob. Okay. You have to put the wood into the fireplace before you get the heat. <laughs> That's right. And like we lose. And, and I, I find myself saying that line to my, to myself right. over and over again, because I think so often we lose sight of what we have to do first to set, set the stage for the results that we are expecting from something. How much of it is about example? I mean, we know this about our kids. We know this about our, our, our every relationship we have. How are we being? I have this, this great example is my, I was teaching my daughter who's now 20, but I was teaching her how to drive. And I told her, look. That's got to be terrifying. Oh, it's horrifying. It's terrible. Absolutely horrible. Call me when you get there because I'll, I'll help you walk through it. And it still won't help you be and, less terrified. And as a also a PI lawyer, it's that much more oh. terrifying. Absolutely. You see it everywhere. You see every conceivable way you can kill yourself with a car in that job. So, but you, you know, you're talking to this kid who's, whose brain is not fully matured and they don't fully understand this thing that they're operating and the dangers out there. And you tell her, look, there's two things that's going to get this car taken from you. One is if you ever drink or do any substance and then get behind the wheel of this thing. That happens one time and you're done. And the other is if I catch you texting while you're driving. That's the other one. And I've spoken at schools about texting and driving. Again, being a, someone who works, I'm a nursing home abuse lawyer, but I've worked in PI firms long enough to know it's a huge problem. So I've spoken at schools. I spoke at her school. But one day, one day when she was about 17, after all of the lectures, after hearing me talk to her school, I got in my truck. She was in the passenger side. I started to back out. I heard a ding on my phone. I picked it up and I started texting. That's it. That's it. The rest of my talks, everything I did, gone. We got to do and we got to be what we're communicating. It's, there's, there's nothing bigger than that. This, where we see this the most, Jordan, in, at least in the world that I'm in, the personal injury world, right? Where, where a lot of it is, you know, eat what you kill, contingency fee. You know, you got to get something resolved before you see any money come in. It's this concept of accountability right? It, it, there's nothing wrong with accountability. It's, it's hugely important. I mean, you cannot have employees who are not accountable. But what does that mean? In the context of, of different leaders or bosses, it can mean a million different things. Like I'll give you the example that, that you might have heard of, right? If I come to you and I say, hey, we've, we've, we've had a really no, another bad year. It's the second bad year in a row. I'm going to start making sure there's accountability. It's a threat. I mean, Again, maybe that's what you want to, to do, but understand that you using the word accountability doesn't change it from you saying, I'll start firing people if you don't start doing better, because that's what they actually hear. You know, I'm accountable to my wife. I'm accountable to my kids and I'm not accountable to either of them because I think they're going to get rid of me if I don't shape up quick. Like I'm accountable because I care about them. Accountability is a uh, two-way street. I, my wife can call me out on accountability. She can come to me and say, hey, the trash didn't go out today. That's your job. And I'm not resentful and bitter. I might get a little pokey, but I'm not resentful and bitter if I know it's my job, if it's been clearly designed to be my job. And I know my wife's got my back. I've got hers. Accountability is two ways. But unfortunately, we see a lot of people, uh, you know, positional leaders, I call them, which is another word for boss. They come in and they go, there's going to be accountability. And what people hear is a threat. And real talented people don't want to be threatened. Simon Sinek, you may have heard of Simon Sinek is a great example of the difference between a boss and a leader. He says, same scenario, you know, guy has, has not made his fee goal in three months. The boss comes in and says, you know, hey, Bill, you've missed your fee goal three months in a row now. If there's a fourth month, I can't guarantee what's going to happen, right? The leader says, hey, Bill, it's been three months where you haven't met your fee goal. Are you okay? 
know what I mean? There's a completely different feeling around those two things. And it's not to say that we can just let people perpetually underperform. Right. But it, it's those kinds of things, though, that we think, all I said was accountability. I don't understand why my entire staff started looking for other work. Because they heard a threat. They didn't hear hey, we got to do better. Hey, I got to do better. They didn't start with themselves, for example. That's, a, that's another really good technique. Here's what I'm going to do. And now let's, let me share what I, what I need from you. So from the, the standpoint of the tip for communication that builds that connection, I mean, obviously, like we can push our people on accountability at some point, but it's what more is, what, what is there more to it other than the you know, genuine care being built first to have that accountability be a two-way street in this example? It's, it's conversation and it's, and look, this is not easy, right? Like, I feel like sometimes you got to pause and go, hey, I recognize how difficult this is. So you're the owner of a law firm and, and your people aren't performing. And as far as you're concerned, and this is important for you to go check and make sure they're underperforming because they're underperforming. They're not underperforming because your case management software is awful. They're not underperforming because you have. It probably is. No offense <laughs> right? to everybody. <laughs> because you don't have processes and procedures and they're not clear on what their role is. Like, first thing I would do before I started getting to, into how do I communicate accountability to my staff is, is it, their, is it really them? I mean, that's where I would start. I would always, as a leader, I would always take the position first of, hey, I'm the thermostat, not the thermometer. What am I not doing? And if I started to recognize that I have not given my people everything they need to be successful, I'm going to lead with that. I'm going to say to them, here's what I'm going to do. Now, I'd be very careful because the other part of being a leader is you got you to do what you say, obviously, because you can't start talking about a accountability with people after you made promises about things you were going to do and didn't follow through Bingo. on them. Bingo. Um, but so what happens is that when you start to have integrity to, to, in your word, you promise less frequently. Right? <laughs> you, don't, you don't start making a lot. People who make a lot of promises, big quantity of promises, you have to like pause for a second and go, it's real easy to promise. I, I, you almost gain integrity points with me up front if I just know you as somebody who doesn't promise very often, because that means you've already gone through the work of, I actually say, actually do what I say. Um, and, and look, we're lawyers. Like we do patents and trademarks, but we don't have a patent or trademark on a specific <laughs> case law. We don't have a motion that only we can file. Like we don't have anything different from each other other than our brain to some extent, but really other than our word. That's right. And so like when you, you know, and this is as little as if you tell a fellow attorney that you are going to see them at some networking event, you know, for the local bar and you don't show up and you flake, right? that is not the same as you, you know, not showing up for a client for court, but it's way more similar than you want to admit in that moment when you are, right. uh, as, as John Mulaney says, canceling plans is like crack for adults. You know, That's like so in true. that moment, because you, you made your word, you made that promise, you set that expectation. And the more that you honor that, uh, the better. And so, I mean, you're hitting right on it, right? What are you actually saying when you don't show up? What you're saying to that person, again, it's hard. This is hard, right? Because you didn't mean to hurt anyone's feelings. You meant to keep the promise when you made it, you know, it really was a conflict. The dog really got sick. It really was cold and rainy out that night. Like you have real legitimate actual reasons for yourself for flaking out. But what that person has every right to hear, I wasn't that important that he could keep his word. That's a problem. That's why you got to promise infrequently. Um, and when you well, promise, you got to suck it up. <laughs> you know. And, I mean? and here's the, the beauty of it. So like we had, we had our friends giving event, um, uh, three weeks ago, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so there were a number of people that told us they would show up and then didn't show up. Right. There's one of them who I swear to you, this is the first time it has ever happened. And he sent me a text like 30 minutes after the event started. I've been trying to get out. We've had patient after patient emergency. I feel so badly. That meant so much more to me, knowing how unique that moment was. Right. versus the other people that were like, oh yeah, I can't make it. Something came up yeah, or, or nothing at all. Because I know that person to be so true to their word that it really was a 
super serious emergency. I've got, I got to the point with my staff and my former associates that are off now running their own departments um, where I, I would say to them, and again, because I wanted to communicate trust. I mean, a big part of communication too, Jordan, is being intentional about it. Like, do you ever just sit down and go, what do I want my staff to, what do I want my staff to feel about me as their boss? You know, or even better is to go, what do I want my staff to feel about themselves with me as their boss? You know, I want to inspire. I'll put that down on a piece of paper. I want to inspire them. I want to believe in them. You know, I want them to trust me and I want them to know I trust them. And so when I say to them, you know, if if I look down at my list of what I want them to feel, and I go in on a, on a Monday and I have a meeting and I say, hey, listen, it's getting really nice out. It's March. Um, it's starting to get really warm. I hope you guys know that I don't need you to call out sick. Like, I don't need you to call out sick. If you guys think you need a mental health day, just tell me you want to go out in the sun. I trust you to do your work. I trust that you're going to get it done. I think you're capable of deciding when a day is critical that you're there or when a day is a little softer and you, you would rather spend that day in the sun with your family. I trust you. That, that's huge. And when I call in, I don't go, <coughs> hey, guys, I'm not coming in today. I know it's opening day of the Nats, but I just don't feel good. I call them up and I go, hey, guys, I'm going to the Nats game today. And you know what they say? Go Nets. We build a relationship where we don't lie to each other, even about silly, stupid things. Instead, a lot of places, they just go around with these little black lies. And everyone knows, like, I know they're not really sick. They know I know they're not really sick, but we're going to tell each other we're sick. And the next day I'm going to say, how are you feeling? And they're going to go, oh, it was a 24 hour thing. We're doing this ridiculous dance and we don't realize we're hurting our trust in each other. It's unnecessary. I care about you. I want you to be great. If, you know, and I'm, it's the same way with, if you consistently suck at your job, a lot of people like right away, it's like, we got to get rid of them. We got to get rid of them. And, and that might be true. But before that ever happens, I'll go up to you and I'll be like, hey, man, is this your job? Is this what you want? Do you like this? I'll start getting cu- curious, you know, how'd you get into this? And if, you, if this job sucks for you, I will coach you to go do something else because I care about you. I'm friends with, I I have text messages, conversations with all my former paralegals, all my former associates. I know their birthdays. I know their, that's another one is family. We're a family. I love that one. First of all, we're not a family, we're business. But when you walk around and you're like, oh, well, we're the Smith and Smith family, you know, the, the law firm family. Dude. When was the last time you just kicked one of your kids out for not performing, you know, well, like you were not a family. We're not backstabbing each other. We're not trying to, to, to hurt each other. This is not a family. My family knows my wife's name. You know, if you want a family culture, because I believe you can build any type of culture you want. You know, you can build a, a law firm full of assassins. You can build a law firm that's very family oriented. But if you're going to build a, build a family law firm, you got to know what your, your staff member's husband's name is. <laughs> so it's about caring and it's about, it all starts with what do you really think of them and what are you trying to get them to feel and think? See, I always, so I, I always push the team, like from a social media standpoint, you know, externally brand, but also internal culture. And I'm always like, look, imagine, you know, that sports team that you follow that's yes. sitting there and fighting with each other and going through it and pulling for each other. I was like, but here's the one difference, you know, that team, the 16th person gets cut. The 56th person gets cut. The right. the 10th person doesn't get to start. So right. we have a team with an unlimited number of seats, you know, like you will never get cut because right. we can find 15 people better than you. That's right. going to make us be a 30 person firm. That's going to make us be a 60 person, you know, whatever it is. That's awesome. And so it's always funny to take those examples because I'm so with you. You know, like I wanted a family culture for so long. Um, and then I realized not, I hate my family because I don't actually <laughs> like my family, but I realized how much everybody hates their family. I realized how much like you have that, you know, un, um, what do you have that unresolved <laughs> issue with that one family member for like, cause 30 years ago, they took the last drumstick on the Turkey at Thanksgiving and they're never going to live it down. 
And that's going to destroy your, you know, that would destroy your firm if you maintain those things. So like Families there's, there's a pro here. Families yeah. are notoriously dysfunctional. Why you're trying to create a family where you don't have the genetics and all the other things that bind it together at your law firm doesn't make a ton of sense to me. I understand the concept. The concept is trying to say, I, I care about you. But again, if you're going to have a family and you can have a family culture at your law firm, I'm not saying you can't, but if you were intentionally creating that, which is what I coach people to do is to like go, what is the culture you want? And what are we going to do to create that culture? A family one, there's going to be a lot of family get togethers. It's going to be a lot of like, everyone's going to each other's kids, little league games, you know, each other's families because you're extending that family into the, into the business. It can be done. I coach a lot of family businesses, you know, law firm, a lot of law firms are mom and, you know, dad and the kid, mom and the kid, you know, and, and it's a bunch of, and, and they all like the rest names of the staff and the they like each other, right? That's right. There's a lot of, you, and then you've got a lot of issues with, you know, can you actually become a partner in this firm if your last name's not, you know, but, but, you know, it's just, it, it's so, it's so quick people so fast. Oh, it's like a family. Like think hard about that. Is that really what you want? Right. Yeah, no, I totally agree. All right. So um, we talked. So I, I want to go back for a second. You, sure. you mentioned the three things. So, you know, we care about you. We can help. And I trust can't even you. read my own handwriting. Do you I trust, trust you to do it? Thank you. Yeah, you trust me. Jeez, that is. Um, from the standpoint of care, like, are we talking empathy? Like, from I'm thinking this more from a client perspective. Sure. So if you've ever been in a it depends on your practice area, but I'll, you know, I'll give you mine, right? There's, there's a few great nursing home attorneys around me here in the DMV and people that I would recommend, quite frankly. I mean, if I, if God forbid I had a nursing home abuse situation in my family and I couldn't handle it for some reason, I would know who to go to, right? When I talk to a client and we're often in what, the proverbial beauty contest, right? Like I know they've spoken to this one and I know they've spoken to this one. And I'm the third one being interviewed now. And I know after I'm done, they're going to talk to the next one. And us four are the ones around here that do this work. If you go into that conversation, just trying to close that deal and all you really care about is getting that client away from the other three and into your, get that retainer signed and, and again, this is difficult because I understand there's real pressure to get that retainer signed and, you know, a big case is a big case, but you don't see it in one isolated interaction. But I can tell you over 25 years, you do see it. When you're able to sit across from a client who could make you money and say, you know what, I actually think you'd be better with Charles over down the road at Cochrane. When you can genuinely go, I don't think I'm the best lawyer for you, not because I'm not great at what I do, but because you have a certain problem that I know he had in another case that he handled so brilliantly that I think he's going to be the better person where I know he's got a relationship with that nursing home that I don't have with that lawyer. I think you're better off. going. If you can do that, those clients, not, you know, not just that client. But the clients who end up coming with you, when you say, if you can be just as honest when you're talking to a client that should choose you, right? You know, and what happens in a lot of those circumstances is they start to say, well, if you'll shave your fee a little bit, I'll go with you instead of them. And I, and I don't do it. I mean, I literally, I will say, like, I would love to have you. The truth of the matter is I don't cut my fee and I really would love to represent you. And I think I'm the best lawyer to do it. But if you can cut a couple points off your fee by going to them, they're a good law, they're a good law firm. I think you'll be fine. I don't think I've ever lost a client saying that because I genuinely, again, it's where you start. Again, it's not what you say. Like you said, you started this whole this whole conversation today with it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Where you're, it's even deeper than that. It's where you're coming from. Here's the truth, and maybe it's I don't want to say it's because I'm a nursing home lawyer. I think I'd be this way with everybody. I deeply care about the problem of nursing home abuse and neglect. And so when I'm speaking to the family of somebody who has lost a loved one in a nursing home that they chose and they're looking for justice, they're looking for sleep because they are haunted by the fact that they put their mom in this place that abused or neglected them. It's just like, it's sort of like that speaking example. 
if I'm sitting there going, can I win this client? Can I get this retainer signed? They may not notice like consciously, but there's a spirit there. They're, 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 they're going to pick up that vibration. And if I get them, they're going to walk with me through three years of some of the most painful, open wounds of their life. And at one point, we're going to be sitting either in a courtroom or we're going to be sitting at a negotiation table and they're going to have to trust me. If you just think about your clients with real, genuine care, your communication is going to be awesome. I mean, that's, that's the truth. Your, your communication is going to be great if you genuinely care about your client and are not focused on the retainer. So, and I love, I love the way you phrase that. Uh, so, th- cause that leads into my question and I want to, I want to phrase this as tactfully as possible. Not going to offend me. Well, and that's not, a, it's, it's not a question of offending you. So like, look, I, I, from the nursing home standpoint, from the personal injury standpoint, when you don't represent the person who is responsible, when it's clear the other person was negligent in causing this, mm-hmm. it's there's like that extra little bump, you know, like, oh my God, this person didn't, in your case, this person yes. didn't want to spend $75,000 a year so that grandma could get, you know, killed by the staff that didn't care. Right. You know, my driver on the way to pick up their kid, you know, my, uh, my mom on the way to pick up their kids from school didn't want to get T-boned by some dude who was texting while right. driving and, you know, all right. that stuff. From the lawyer listening to this, though, that has the client, you know, whether it's, whether it's family law and you're representing the deadbeat of the two parents, whether it's criminal defense and the client tells you how they did it and they did it so many other times, like in a situation like that, where you don't have that, is that, are you called to the wrong profession? If you have to kind of overcome that, is there a way for you to change things differently? Is it a belief that you have internally of, you know, everybody deserving their day and their best shot? Like what's the way to still have that genuineness? Yeah. So this is, this is, the better lives part of better lawyers, better leaders, better lives. Um, it's going to sound so idealistic. So I want to, again, I feel like I want to pause and say, I understand that you're the first year associate and your boss hands you what we used to call the D files, the, the minor impact soft tissue, 16 prior lawsuits, neck and back soft tissue, you know, I, I've been there. I learned, I learned that way. Um, that's different than somebody who's 20 years in and they feel that way, right? So if you are in the personal injury space and you believe that insurance companies take the premiums and then nickel and dime people who are, who are significantly injured or even just genuinely injured. The truth of the matter is, if an insurance company takes the premium and doesn't pay out on the minor impact case, you know, a fair number, doesn't have to be a huge number, but a fair number. They just, they just, they're, they're going to roll the dice and hope that a jury, you know, hits you with all the tort reform nonsense out there. Um, we'll roll the dice rather than pay what we actually owe or to force you to take, you know, a fraction of what you're, you're entitled to. If that bothers you, if that whole thing really upsets you, then the fact that occasionally you get a client who's not great until you can make the decision for yourself. Now, what I would say is the person who continues to take those cases when they are allowed to make the decision is very different, right? I think about defense lawyers and and I don't envy them at all, but I will say when you defend a nursing home, I mean, sometimes they get cases against, I know because I file them. I don't even have, they must get that thing land on their desk and they just go, how the heck do I defend this case, right? That's such a different world than the plaintiff. The plaintiff gets to choose their case. And if we're choosing it for the wrong reason, namely, I can probably squeeze a couple bucks out of this and put it in my pocket. That will build up over the years until you just don't see much of a purpose in what you're doing. Um, I know plaintiffs, car accident lawyers that are brutally passionate about what they do. They really believe the system is is jacked up in favor of insurance companies over little guys, and they'll take a minor impact whiplash case. And, you know, it'll be the biggest thing in the world to them because it's not that case. It's that cause. 
it's that cause. Like I'm not letting them rob this guy of even 2000 bucks because it's wrong. If you don't have that, you know this, Jordan. I mean, if you don't have some moral drive to make a difference with your work, it will eat you up. Eventually, it will it will eat you up. These that, that is the alcohol, divorce, suicide. I think you know it's that poor leadership, crazy hours. It's a tough job. I mean, it's it's a, it's a hard job when you have passion for it. It's a very hard job. You know, the other side in litigation, the other side is, is the greatest example I ever heard of, of, of litigation is imagine a, a brain surgeon who's trying to do surgery, but another brain surgeon comes into the room and starts swatting at your hands and trying to make you mess up. <laughs> it's hard when you love it. So you got to love it. That's a really long winded answer to your question. I, I think you have to if, if you can't get excited about the case, you should be excited about the cause. That's well, and I love the. You know, obviously those are D files on a, you know, on an A to D on a grading scale. Yeah. But I think, but from your answer, it's those are D files as in you're paying your dues. You know, those are, those are the dues that you're putting in. And that's the mindset you would have, right? I'm going to learn how to do this. I'm going to learn how to do that. I mean, I, I, I did never enjoyed, I didn't really enjoy the D files, you know, I mean, they were tough, but I learned where to stand. I learned how to ask questions. And in some ways, I mean, everyone always has this debate about, are, are you screwing the client by handing the young kid the D file? Here's the truth. The, D, the, the kid on the D file is probably going to try 10 times harder than the, than the experienced lawyer would. I know I did. I know when I got my D file on my first or second trial, I was up all night trying to, trying to, trying to win it, you know? Um, so I don't know. I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that the D files are being handled by inexperienced people. I, I think the best way is if you have an experienced person with you, but sometimes that's not possible, you know? Well, and I think that's the, uh, there, there is no situation in which everybody could start out as a state attorney or public defender, but that is the easiest way for you to get the experience that's that Joe just talked about. I mean, like, dude, I that's remember... The, the first trial I had, you know, it was like me and my intern on trial one. And then the P, you know, the PD's been in there for two weeks. I've been in there for three weeks. And then, but their supervisor sits, he's like board certified, having done 150 trials. And when I tell you they ran circles around us, like they ran circles around us, but you know what? So be it, you know, the, uh, that's such is well, the case. The guy was found, uh, not guilty and everybody went home happy. And that's a, you know, that's a great example is the criminal defense lawyers. I mean, there's a lot of people who ask criminal defense lawyers, you know, how do you do it? How do you defend people you know are guilty, right? And what do they say? The real great ones, what do they say? They say- It's, it's easier about, than defending somebody who's innocent. Right. It's I got to make sure that nobody who's innocent ends up in prison. My, I have to test the state. That mental shift is humongous. It's humongous. Because if you're walking around going, I just get losers off. I get I get criminals back on the street. If that's how you see yourself, my God, you're going to kill yourself. And that that, that is going to be a horrible work day every single day. But if you're what? sitting there going, I keep the government honest and make sure that regular citizens don't get bullied by the biggest, most powerful thing on earth. You see yourself differently, right? I love there's a, uh, there, I want to say it's a meme making around, but like literally it's an actual billboard and it's the criminal defense attorney. It says, just because you did it doesn't mean you're guilty. Call me. <laughs> and, yeah, I've seen that. and it's, I, I think it's, having been a prosecutor, having done criminal defense, I think it's hysterical. Yeah. But then part it's of me is like, people. I can't even imagine what kind of calls this person gets. Oh my God. Like this is the, yeah, I shot the dude on video and then I told the police and I walked them to the other bodies. But like, come on, man, you can get me probation, right? Like, <laughs> it's, it's on the billboard, you know? Marketing. It's a whole other podcast. <laughs> Marketing. Yes and no, man. I mean, like, look, the, the longer that I do this and the more that I read, like, the most ridiculously eclectic cross-section of books, the more I realize the best advice applies to everything in your life. You know what? You're absolutely right. Because, you know, you, I'm sitting here going, well, that's marketing. Marketing is communication. You know, the, the way I describe to you, the way I think about my nursing home clients, that they've been betrayed, that they're, they can't sleep. You know, the, the, the mantra in our practice before I started my own firm and the, the mantra that will be in my new firm is, you know, we turn victims into victors um, and we get closure and we bring peace, right? That's what we're about. We're about closure. And 
that comes out in everything I do. It comes out in my speeches. It comes out in when I'm when I'm doing writing copy, when I'm talking to a referral partner, when I'm talking to a client, and when I start doing marketing. That should be consistent. I won't have a billboard that says, "Hey, if you fell in a nursing home, I'm going to get you cash, cash, cash," with dollar signs. Like that doesn't fit who I am. You have to be consistent with what you really are, and and the right clients will come to you as long as you're consistent. And if you are the guy who really just loves the cash and that's what you're about and you don't care, then by all means, go ahead. Go for it, yeah. Go for it. No, I think, you know, it's funny. It's funny to me that, look, I follow a ton of marketing people in all, in different industries, in varying success rates, in different places on their journey. And I think everybody hammers on geographics and demographics. Like you got a specific type of person in a specific area but so many of them, I think, don't hammer on the psychographics enough. You know, like the why is this person going to do this? Uh, what is the true? Like, what are you actually? What are you actually selling as a lawyer? Like, what is it your clients buying? You know, they don't. It's are you? Are they buying a pile of cash? Are they buying an opportunity to be heard? Are they buying a chance to make a situation right? Like, what's the actual thing that they want? Because I promise you, nobody really wants legal services. They have a problem that they want solved in a certain way for a certain reason. What is so hysterical about that is that, again, I, I, you know, because I'm so kind of in the nursing home world, every example I have is about the nursing home. But when I speak to a jury and I'm talking about what does a nursing home actually sell, right? You know, because they don't sell nursing services. They sell trust. They sell peace. It is hard to put your mom in a nursing home. When that nursing home says, we're going to treat your mother like they're our family, because that's what they all say, they're selling you trust and peace. And when the jury finds out that the place that said, I'm going to treat your mom like they're mine, was chronically and purposefully understaffed so that the owners could have a private jet. They, they were treating them like they were family. <laughs> that's right. Cutting, cutting all the corners. <laughs> Put, filling all the, you know, taking all the crap from the kids and just shoving them in that one closet and hoping nobody opens the door. That's, ex that's exactly right. That that drives the jury crazy. But we don't think in our marketing, what do clients really want when they are calling me? You know what they're what they want when they're calling me? They either want vengeance. If we're being honest, they're furious. They trusted somebody, and they killed their mother. They want their guilt to be alleviated. They want someone to say it wasn't your fault, like a jury. It was their fault. I'm selling closure and justice. And sometimes, as much as I wouldn't put it on a billboard, vengeance. I can't tell you how many times I hear a client. And you can listen to your clients. And this is back to communication. Just listen to your clients. Right. They'll, they'll tell you exactly what they want. I tell a client, look, I don't think your case is significant enough for the cost it's going to take, which is a big part of nursing home is choosing the right case. Um, and they'll say, I don't care about the money. You can, you can keep the money. I, I, I'll donate it. I'll, I'll sign something right now. I just want them to pay. Right. They don't care. My clients don't care about getting the money. They care about them paying money. They're mad. Well, once you know that, your marketing, hey, don't let them get away with it. It's a brilliant tagline for a nursing home. If you have a nursing home practice and you you are selling, don't let them get away with it. I can tell you for 25 years, that's what, that's what every client says to me. I can't let them get away with this. Or I can't let this happen to someone else, giving meaning to the loss of their loved one. Yeah. Listen to your clients. This is listen to your clients, listen to your staff. Listen to your partners, listen to your wife, listen to your kids. Communication begins with listening. You're teaching kids how to, you know, you ever teach a young kid how to take a debt? When I say a young kid, a young lawyer, <coughs> how to take a debt. I told every associate I've ever had. Depositions are not taken with this, this outline you have in your hand. You have a you know, 20-page outline. What is your name? Have you ever been deposed before? What did you review to prepare for your deposition today? I mean, and it's like this thick. That's fine. Do the work, do the prep. That's fine. But depositions are taken with your ears. It's when a witness says, um, have you ever been convicted of a crime? Um, not really. 
you need to not go to the next question. You need to follow up on that because they just told you something. You know, there's something there by the way they answered that question. So you take it with your ears, but that's everything. Listen to your client. You wanted to get better at marketing? Listen to your clients. You want to get better at leadership? Listen to your staff. Well, I love, I mean, we're talking about, we're talking about tips for communication that build connection. And so I think so many people go into this thinking like, how do I say something the right way? But I love that you have flipped this because also it's me listening. It is, it is communication in both directions to build connection in both directions. Without, without question. And I think, you know, you hit on something really important. I think that, because I think this is the same problem with leadership. It's too soft, right? I mean, how many people are spending, excuse me, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, something, maybe more, on learning to be better at marketing, right? But they don't go to leadership seminars, and the reason is marketing is tangible. Like, I need my ROI to be X, Y, Z. Leadership is soft. That's what they say. Leadership is soft. But oh, you, okay. You, I thought you meant like, okay, I got it. No, no, no. What I mean, is I, like, I didn't hear I, what you said. Didn't impact me the way that you meant it. All right, now, Mon. Now, I wasn't being intentional in my communication. Then, <laughs> see, the, the, a lot of people think communication skills, leadership skills, that they're too soft to invest in, like, or that they just, you know, I already have it. Like, I know how to talk. I'm a lawyer, right? But then they spend all this money on marketing. And they haven't led their staff and they ha- they're not communicating well with their staff and you're not getting the ROI you could be getting. The truth of the matter is communication is no different in a lot of ways than marketing is. If you were going to start marketing your, your firm or your business, you would sit down, quiet, no distractions and say, okay, I'm going to build a marketing plan and I'm going to implement this plan and I'm going to evaluate its effectiveness regularly. Do you have a communication plan for your staff? Do you know exactly what it is you want your, your staff to believe about you and the firm? Are you constantly reinforcing that you care, that you want to help them grow and develop them, and that you can be trusted intentionally? Does, is your mission in your firm something that is just you know, one time in some document that they can access on some drive? Or is it constantly being reinforced in, we make our merit review decisions because we make victims into victors. We only take serious cases. We never throw it against the wall. These these kinds of of value-based communications are so important so that it can get ingrained into your people so that it's happening when you are not there. In a very real way, leadership and communication is what can help free you from micromanaging. If you're a poor communicator or even an unintentional communicator, meaning you're not spending any time thinking about your leadership plan, your culture, or your communication, you're just talking a lot. <laughs> you know, you're just having to say things over and over and over again, and you feel misunderstood. It's because you're not thinking and taking time to be intentional about your communication. You should spend a predetermined amount of time, whether it's every week, every two weeks, once a month, at once a quarter, going, what am I communicating? How am I communicating it? What am I? What is the point I'm trying to get a, across? And then the, the flip, what am I learning from my people? What am I inviting my people to tell me about how they're doing, about how the firm is doing, what they want more of, what they want less of? It's that two-way two-way street. That's how you build a culture. Well, and I love, um, I just finished uh, Made to Stick by uh, Chip and Dan Heath. Oh, I haven't read that one. I love, so, I love, Chip, I love Chip and Dan Heath. You know, I, don't exactly. Know. So I, I thought it was great. Um, it's very much, if you ever read Contagious by Jonah Berger, but like this is more from, so this is a very similar book, but more from like a long-term big marketing mm-hmm. agency perspective, whereas Contagious is more like the virality of social media. Right. So the example that they use that, that I bring up for this purpose, they talk about like Disney calling their employees cast members versus Subway calling their employees sandwich artists. Like from a cast member perspective, just from that name, of course, Disney does a ton of training, but just from that name, it's clear like you are in a role. So right. you don't hang out with guests outside of your role. You don't right. walk across them. Right. You know, they don't want to see Tigger with his head off smoking a cigarette right. from the person underneath. Like there's all these things from it. Whereas like sandwich artist, 
if you put an extra piece of turkey on the sandwich to be an artist, you'd probably get written up and, you know, or, or punish, you know, mm-hmm. docked for it in some manner. So it's like using these right nomenclatures to make it, you know, to make the example or to make the performance make sense, whether that's core values, whether that's titles, that's whether that's like whatever, it just, it really a lot allows people to have the right context to make the right decisions. We have, you know, some of the, some of the, main kind of um, value systems that that we had at my old practice and that we have in the new practice is things like no gossip, right? Like no gossip. It's just something we don't do. If you gossip, it is dead. It's just like the texting example we talked about earlier. You know, they see you texting. If you gossip, you know, what you label people, what you say about your values it is meaningless if you're not living them out, which is, which again, like promising infrequently, but always keeping your promise. Choose your values, not on aspirations. Mm-hmm. Choose values that you really believe in right now and can, can stick to, you know? I mean, believe what you really believe. I don't want people who are indifferent to nursing home abuse working in my law firm. I mean, you got to kind of, you know, you can't look at bed sores and rapes of old ladies and beatings and people putting cigarettes out on, on, on the elderly. You, you can't do this work every single day if you just don't care about the cause of elder abuse, right? I mean, it's just kind of, it wouldn't fit. Makes little sense. All right. So uh, as we get towards the end here, any yeah. other tips that you want to make sure we cover? Otherwise, we'll dive right into our, uh, our biggest takeaway. You know, I, I, think, I think it's important just to, to mention that as a leader, and I, that's kind of who I coach. I coach you know, leaders. And that doesn't just mean the owners of a law firm, although it often is. Um, it can be the, the leader of a practice group, even a solo who has a paralegal is a leader, right? I mean, heck, even a paralegal can be a leader themselves, right? So I don't believe in positional leadership. I think you know, leadership is influence, nothing more. So you can be influential from the bottom up in my world, right? So leaders inspire you know, leaders have to set the energy of the communication, which is this idea of the thermostat versus the thermometer. So Monday morning, you walk into a, a conference room, your people are sitting around for the Monday morning, you know, round table that you have every week, and they're tired and they're grumpy and it's Monday, and you walk in and take on the energy of that room that's being the thermometer. Your communication is going to get it drawn down. Your energy is going to get drawn down. As the leader, it's really your job to sit outside that room for a beat and go, what am I going to bring into this room? I'm Jukebox to- hero. Yeah. Crank it up to 10. Exactly. Kool-Aid man down the door. You're going to have to walk in there and hold the energy of it's going to be a great week. Let's be positive. We got a lot of great things going. I believe in you. Let's get it. Let's get it going. And you're going to have to overcome, you know, or, or sometimes after a really tough loss, you know, in the, in the PI world, you don't just lose your fee. A lot of times you lose your costs and it's damaging. It's hurtful. It's rough. And, and some leaders walk in and it's about blame. Other leaders would walk in and say, you know, the Stockdale paradox. Have you ever heard of that? I have not. Stockdale paradox in you know, three sentences is it's based on Admiral Stockdale. It says the leader has to be brutally honest about the current conditions. Like if you, if your law firm has lost its last 10 trials and you guys are, are sinking, you can't walk around telling everybody it's rosy. They know. And remember, number three was, can they trust you? So the Stockdale paradox says, you as the leader must be brutally honest in your assessment of the current conditions. It is raining, it is storming, it is bad. But the paradox is the leader also must hold for the team, the absolute certainty that the final destination will be met, will be reached. So yes, it is dark. Yes, it is bad. Yes, it is tough. We will get there. I I am just as certain that we're going to get there as I am that it's dark right now. I love it. All right. So for anybody who's been listening to this for, uh, we are an hour, a little over an hour. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, listen, it's, this is, this is great. I just hope, uh, I'm, I'm good until the 30. I hope you don't have anything at the 15. No, I'm good. I'm good. All right, cool. 
Um, so for anybody who's listening to this for now, an hour, right on the dot, um, if they remember nothing else that you said, what would be the most important takeaway, the biggest nugget of wisdom to help more lawyers be the exhibit A of a successful attorney such as yourself? Communicators, great communicators, and I should say better, great connectors, which is what we're really talking about. They're givers. They're serving first. They're looking for how they can benefit the receiver. It's not to say you don't have an expectation of performance or that something's going to come back to you, but the reason you're communicating is for the receiver. Same with thing, the reason you're leading, the reason you're developing, the reason you're trying to give the mission to them is so that they grow for them. That's, I think, the most important thing. I think you have to be thinking about your people when you're communicating, not yourself. I love it. All right. So thank you to everybody who has watched and listened uh, to this episode. Really appreciate your time. We hope to see you in our Solutions for Lawyers by Lawyers group with any follow-up questions. I know Joe is in there all the time answering and helping out, providing some great advice. So if you've got any of those uh, specific takeaways or things you want to go deeper on, please, please, please drop a thing in there. And uh, we'll see you there as well as at the next show. With that, have a wonderful week, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. And Joe, thank you so much for being with me today. Oh, it's been a pleasure. It's been a blast. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you for listening to this episode of Exhibit A Attorneys. If you're interested in becoming the Exhibit A of a successful attorney, please check us out at LegalEaseMarketing.com, E-A-S-E.